All right, now. Well, welcome everyone. We ready to get started, Eric? And he's okay, we're good? We're good, we're good. let's go. Right, welcome everyone. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, first of all, I just wanna say welcome. My name is Miguel Bustos and I'm the director for the Center for Social Justice. And I have the honor and the privilege to work with the wonderful, talented team of committed, loving people. And I want to just right up front thank Isoke Fime, who's our um, maven of transformation. And we have uh, Hannah, who is our social justice project coordinator, as well as Eric Aguayo, who's our community engagement manager. Just a wonderful group of people that work very hard with others at Glide to make this event happen. First of all, happy, happy Black History Month. What a joyous, joyous occasion for us to get together. Although we should, at Glide, we think every day is Black History Day and every month is Black History Month. Why? Because the community matters. And so we want to welcome all of you for joining us at the Center for Social Justice, you know, Black uh, African American Heritage Month and especially for this particular event. Uh, just want to remind you that there are other events throughout the year, other gatherings that we have that are similar in nature and speaking truth and, and learning about the truth that we hope you will continue to join us for. Um, we also have on the church side, we have our, our white anti-racist group that meets every Friday. Um, you contact the church. We have the email right there. I mean, the, the yeah, the email is right there. Uh, please sign up. As for a Glide e-newsletter on glide.org, hit subscribe. And if you're so inclined and if you're so moved by today's gathering of all of us together, of this tribe, of this family, then we would ask, please make a donation. Um, all our events are, are free and open to the public. So whatever you can, we greatly appreciate it. It helps keeps us going. Um, and also sign up at glide.org backslash events so that you can get up to date on the many events that are happening. And so with that, Isoke Femi, who is our maven, our tia, our everything at Glide. So thank you, Isoke. Thank you, Miguel. Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So glad to see you here, some of you again, some of you for the first time. Um, I wanna just, I was, while the music was playing and I was thinking, I thought, oh my gosh, like the, you are, we are ushering in a new world order. It's been coming for a while, but we are on the cutting edge of it. We are ushering in a new world order. I'm assuming that whoever is here has already made the decision that anti-blackness needs to go. I made I, I make that assumption. Otherwise, I assume people wouldn't be here. Um, and even if you aren't decided on that, uh, hopefully tonight will get you closer to that decision. And if it doesn't, that's okay. I recently heard um, a quote of Nelson Mandela. Someone told me he said, "I never lose." I either win or I learn. <laughs> and I love that sentiment, right? And I, it reminded me of when he and, and the, guy, the, the men who were imprisoned with him on Robben Island, when they first got there, he told them, the first thing to know is that this is not a prison. This is a schoolhouse. So I think he was really committed to this idea that you turn everything into education, everything into learning, so that the next time around, you're more prepared. The next time around, you're smarter. You just get smarter. So I love that. Um, but we're happy to have you. And when I say that you are on the cutting edge of a new world order, part of what I mean is that I think you're lights. You are lights. You are. You look like bodies, you look like uh, white people and brown people and black people. You look like men and women, but you are souls, you are spirits, you are lights that um, are needed in a time of, of where the darkness has kind of taken a pretty strong uh, hold on us. So 
I appreciate you bringing your light. I appreciate you even opening to the possibility that your light is going to help us get out of the mess that we find ourselves in. So um, in the spirit of Glide, we always like to have, um, you know, some song, actual song. Now, some people on this call know this song, and if you do, sing along with your mic off. Um, and uh, otherwise, I will sing it just to kind of bring us in. This is a song we, uh, one of the Glide congregants wrote. Um, Jan Zen, Zen, how do you say her name, do you know? Zito. Anyway, she's, uh, she wrote this song. And um, it's, uh, we use it when we go to uh, Alabama. It's kind of the theme song for going to Alabama on this sacred pilgrimage that we take at Glide to look at the history of slavery and um, all the way through to mass incarceration. You'll hear more about that if you, if you check out uh, events. But anyway, this is the theme song. It's called Rise in Step. Rise in step, one by one, when all of our voices sing out loud, it can be done. I know it begins with me, so that one day soon, We'll all be truly free. I'll do one more round. And if you're, if you're game, you know, with your, because if you do it with your mic on, it'll be cacophony. But with your mic off, sing it with me. And the words are rise in step one by one. When all of our voices sing out loud, it can be done. I know it begins with me so that one day soon, we will all be truly free. Rise in step, one by one. When all of our voices sing out loud, it can be done. I know it begins with me. So that one day soon, we'll all be truly free. Now, if there's someone from Glide Congregation who knows that song, turn on your mic and sing it. Sing one verse for us. Oh, I see Reggie, hey Reggie. Anybody from Glide or, or from the pilgrimage? Bissa, somebody? Give us a verse. We always, I always like to bring in other voices. Ready? Yep. <clears throat> Rise and step one by one. When all our voices sing out loud, it can be done. Ah, oh, it begins with me so that one day soon we'll all be truly free. Thank you, Bissa. Um, Bissa is in the New Bridges class, which is one of uh, Glide's programs, the Center for Social Justice programs. And uh, you should, if you're curious about that, check it out because we are, one of the things we're about at New Bridges is pulling off the layers of gunk that have been thrown onto our mirrors. Lies about who we are as humans and what we're capable of. We're trying to fling that stuff off so that we can free up the inner liberator. Um, and we have, it's, it's deep work, it's challenging work, uh, and it can be fun work as well. So wanted to make sure you know about that. So I'm wondering, um, I'm 
this, uh, this work is mighty work. And I have been preparing myself for it much of my life. If we were able, if there was time, we could ask each of you, what, what things have happened in your past that explain why you're here this moment in this group? You pro we call them calling moments. Something called you to this. Something has called you. And I was called. And I feel like the call for me, although I haven't always been super clear about what it is, is the call to work for everyone's liberation, starting with my own. Because I can't, I can't work towards anybody else's liberation if I'm all messed up and I haven't looked at my own stuff, so to speak. Or, and healed some of it. So I'm following a call and the call gets louder. It's not like it just, okay, now I'm doing my call and I'm just, you know, it gets louder. And it's saying to me more, 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 let more of me through that me being the spirit, the light, let me through, let me through, don't hold me back. And it kind of reminds me of that, you know, uh, African spiritual, you know, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. That is what the world needs. It needs our light. And so this work is about moving out of the way whatever is blocking that light. That's the work, that's the work as I see it. I know I can't put that on you, but that's how I see it. So there are some you know, things about it, like we forgive each other for the ways that we have uh, unwittingly bought into a system that holds certain people at the bottom, that privileges others, and that tricks us into believing that the privileged people are doing okay. We know better. We know that the people who have privilege are not necessarily faring well because spiritually, we all want the world to work well. And it doesn't work well if some have and some don't, if some are loved and some are hated. It, it just doesn't work. So, Yeah, we try not to blame each other for the ways that we got confused, for the mistakes, for the errors in judgment, for believing in the lies and the illusion of white supremacy or the illusion of black inferiority and all the other inferiorities that we buy into the, the illusion. Uh, we start from the place of saying, okay, this happened. In the beginning, maybe I had nothing to do with it, but in time I became a, a participant either by, through silence or actually just taking advantage. Um, but that doesn't make me bad. Like you can't live in that kind of smog and not take it on. You can't live under uh, a world that has promulgated the idea of black inferiority and not have it get in. Everybody gets, it gets in everywhere. So we just wanna bring a forgiving, warm-hearted uh, stance because we think that we, go, we get better. We get better results when we do it that way. Um, so if you're looking to get beat up on, <laughs> it's in the wrong room right now. This is the wrong Zoom room. And I am gonna ask for those of you who still think that, um, um, being harsh with people who haven't figured out some things, that that's okay. I'm gonna ask you to just let that go for, for this, at least for this session, just let that go. And imagine that you don't have to police anybody. You don't have to be anybody's um, conscience. You just get to be you and you get to receive everybody else where they are. So at Glide, we have this, um, we, we have, we use harm reduction in uh, relation to many, th many of the social ills that people are dealing with. And, and what it means is you, you meet people where they are. 
So when we're dealing with addiction, which is the place where you hear about harm reduction the most, you know, Glide, Glide's harm reduction stance is that they don't tell people they need to get clean. They don't tell people that they need to, you know, um, that there's anything wrong even with what they're doing, but that we're here for you, where you are. How can you reduce the harm that, that is being caused in your life? And if the day ever comes when you wanna go further with your uh, into recovery, we're here. And you'll likely come because we never judged you. We never stood in judgment of you. That's the stance we wanna have with, uh, as we try to figure out how to be part of this uh, campaign to end uh, anti-blackness. So that's the, that's, the, that's the ground we're on right there. Um, now I notice, you know, there's 53 people on here. It's impossible uh, given the time to make this a conversation. But those of you who know me know that I would ideally want this to be a conversation like, let's talk, let me hear from you. And um, I will you know, try to make space for a little bit of that after, as we move through the agenda. But for now, what is, what is anti-blackness? What is it? I don't really have like a, a clear definition. Um, it's an illusion, it's a grand illusion. It's built on a grand illusion that was created in order to make some things that were unacceptable be more acceptable. No humans would have really agreed to the enslavement and 244 years of legal enslavement of a people if they hadn't been convinced and convinced themselves that they weren't dealing with full-fledged humans. And so a grand campaign had to take place to convince everyone that this was the natural order, that nothing bad was really happening here, that it was even better that Africans were better off to be um, enslaved and, tr and mistreated, et cetera, et cetera. But a very, very complex system of thought was evolved, evolved to support that and to keep it in place. So it has to do with everything. I wanna look at the flip side of it, which is the side that we call um, the domestication of everybody, right? Like how whiteness, and I want you to hear this whiteness, not as about a color of skin, but as a mindset, a, a system of domestication that got attached to whiteness, got equated with whiteness. And in that sense, white people have been deeply injured because there's been a whiteification of white people. <laughs> a whiteification that says, you aren't embodied, you aren't soulful, you don't have a history of deep spirituality and, uh, and creativity. Like, I can't tell you how many times in my workshops people say, oh, I'm just uh, white bread, I'm just wonder bread, I'm just white, nothing, I'm just white. Um, whiteness. The whiteification process stripped white people of their complexity and their uniqueness, right? So how does that end up living out? It's how you walk, it's how you talk, it's how you show up in a meeting, it's how you show up in the world. All kinds of ways that say, there's only this proper way to be, unless you're at a football game or unless you're, there are some places where you can let some of this other stuff out but it's a very narrow cage. And it's not just white people who are in it. Everybody has been recruited to be in this cage of whiteness. I mentioned this earlier and uh, we, we had this, uh, this is a repeat of uh, a workshop that we did earlier today for staff. And I wanted to do a shout out for Pam Noli because 
I was telling people that I attended a church and you were there, Reggie, I attended a church uh, Saturday work meeting where we were thinking about the future of Glide and Miguel, you were there too. Um, and the question came up like about how would Glide be defined? How, what, what kinds of things would we say about Glide in the future? And, um, and there was a, a bit of a conversation about whether or not the word black should, should have been in there because as I'll show you in a moment, um, so much of Glide's culture is rooted in Southern black ethos, Southern black culture. Um, and people get nervous when you say it because they, they it's kind of like Black Lives Matter. It makes people like, wait a minute, are you saying Black people are better? Are you saying, what are you saying? It makes people nervous. And we all can cave under the pressure of that. So I could feel myself sort of saying, well, I guess as long as you're holding it in your mind, it's okay. And Pam said, no. She said, no, if you don't say that this is a place that preserves blackness, it will default to whiteness. It will automatically default to whiteness. And I was like, I never heard that. I never heard that come out of a white person's mouth before. And I remember feeling so, um, held in that, so seen in that because when black folks say those kinds of things, people get even more nervous. So thanks again, Pam. I mean, you're probably gonna hear this story a million times. You'd be like, Lord, I'm tired of this story. But it's important, um, I think. So a couple more things, and then we're gonna get you into small groups. Um, I wanna just kind of lay a little bit of groundwork here. Um, for those of you who don't know, in 1964, Cecil Williams was um, uh, assigned to Glide um, by the bishop. And um, he came, he was this three piece, he was a suited guy with a you know, very you know, close cut hair do and you know, close shave. And um, he, but he carried with him this fire for justice. And he also um, seemed to have this mission of like, I am here for everybody. Like the mission I'm on is that I'm gonna be the minister of liberation and it's gonna be everybody. The pimps, the hustlers, the j jazz players, the prostitutes, the, you know, the single moms, the queers, everybody, everybody. The church is not the building, the church are the people. And this building is in the Tenderloin. That means the people of the Tenderloin, this is their church. I don't know if you can feel how radical that is. That is such a radical idea. Um, and there was a lot of pushback, a lot of pushback. A lot of people left the church. White folks left the church. Um, but over time, and then uh, Janice Mirakatani, his, who later became his wife, joined in the mission a year later, and the two of them just created this incredible community, a beloved community of people. Um, I had not been to Glide, but I, I had a conversation with one, somebody one day, and the person said, you know, the first time I went to Glide, <laughs> I sat in a pew. There was one woman who looked like she was from Marin, all well coiffed, thin white woman with blonde hair, sitting next to somebody who didn't have anything on but a diaper and a pair of angel wings. And I was like, what church, what church? Let somebody be there with a diaper and angel wings, you know, <laughs> like, oh my gosh, I was blown away. Um, so just a few bullet points about Cecil. Um, he was born in Texas, deeply segregated, saw a lot of brutality, um, and was himself the target of brutality. And then at age 11, he had this experience that he, you know, he sometimes refers to as a, a, a nervous breakdown, um, but he saw, you know, he had like hallucinations of beings who were trying to get at him and they were white. And, you know, this, the fight, the struggle with these beings and this state of mind lasted for, uh, I think a year. And during which time he didn't go to school, his family took care of him. They, 
they, you know, they did everything for him and he came out of it. And I think that it's, he, he faced the demons that were in that, in those hallucinations. And it was there, I think that he was, his, his ministry was born there. So he started preaching to his sisters, anybody who would listen, he would pretend pe preach all over the place. Um, and his vision was that he was gonna have a church where everybody belonged, everybody belonged. So he comes to Glide in a relatively short period of time, he takes down the crucifix, he takes all the hymnals out, whatever is people feeling like this is our church, he removed it. And we're talking about a deeply indoctrinated Christian man. Um, I think the key thing about this is that somewhere along the way, Cecil decided he was gonna be himself. This comes to me because as we're in Black History Month and you know, staff at Glide, we we're you know, having events and there the question comes up, you know, should, should it be all black? Um, and this, it, there's no easy answer because there is a need sometimes for a, an affinity group to just be together and love each other up and uh, be in their cultural mix without having to feel bad about it. That's not the problem, but um, I think what Cecil would, would say to us is let anybody come and you make sure it's a black event, be you, because that's what I did and that's what I'm gonna always do is be me. And that is what has magically happened at Glide is that people feel like they can be themselves. You see all kinds of people at Glide. So I think that Glide is an example of how anti-Blackness can be, if not erased, lessened greatly, greatly. And we'll, in a minute, we'll get to why, why I think that's true. So, I think um, now we want to go into breakout rooms. And we're going to um, go in there in three, in three way, um, at, in, tri in triads. There's always a battle inside of me about do I be me or do I be some programmed facilitator kind of place that I thought I learned about. Um, and there's always a way that I feel a little torn about that. Let me, um, Yeshi, do you feel like talking for a moment? Just about the, t the dyad and the reason we do it the way we do it? Sure. Um, what do you want me to talk about? Just the dyad, because we're going to go into triads, but it's uh -huh. the listening. Yeah, so what we're about to do is go into a process where um, when you are the person who is listening, so in a group of three, that means you have, there's two occasions when you're listening and only one of talking. When you listen. It's not just a thing of, that you do with your ears, but with your whole being. And just you put aside for that moment, that however much time that person is talking, you just bracket your own agenda. Like whatever, whatever you want to say, just pull that off and take in deeply what the other person is saying because it's a gift. Whatever they are offering is a gift that you get to receive. So that's what, what you do when you're listening. So don't interrogate them or ask them questions because they may be going on one track. You may be interested in, some, in a, something, but there, let them go on their own track, however they're going to speak. And when you're the speaker, you get to do that. Like you get to speak. And what happens in that process and the way that he's okay, he's going to invite us into is that not only do we discover things when we're listening, but we discover things that we didn't even know we needed or wanted to say when we're talking. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, so there are two questions um, that we want you to address in here. Uh, the first one is, how has anti-Blackness affected you personally? And the second question is, what's one thing that would look different in a world without anti-Blackness? So it might be very tempting to comment, editorialize, correct people, but just use this as an opportunity to learn to listen because that is a liberatory tool. It may not feel like it now, but it is. So um, Hannah's gonna put us into uh, triads. Well, Bess and Kristen, how will we do that? Are there other people who are in pairs right now? Let's just trust the process, Isoke. Okie okay, dokie. Should I put the questions right. in the chat, Isoke? Yeah, yeah, that would be great. I'll share them as well. You all in a bit? Rod, hi Rod. Hi, it's okay. <laughs> Good to see Good you. To see you. Good evening. Good evening. So how were your how were your small groups? Mine? Anybody's. Oh. Everybody's. Quick and rich. Quick and rich? Mm-hmm. Very good, very good, very insightful, lots of meanings. Wonderful. Thanks for doing that. Sarah, we're gonna continue our conversation, okay? It was get it was getting good. <laughs> <laughs> if you were gonna I appreciate be that. <laughs> If you were going to be continuing, if you were going to be continuing in this conversation, um, what's a question or a thought you don't want to let go of and just type it into the chat because we can capture that. Um, so we would love to just, just type, you know, any question, thought, something you want to continue with, something that got sparked for you. Just type it into the chat. Um, so that if you're interested, we do have these uh, groups, um, New Bridges groups that um, it's our attempt to provide people a container in which to ask questions, have feelings, explore what's happened, help each other to heal and recover. And to and you know in a way like build in some some loving accountability with each other. Um, so if you're interested in taking you know this further, that's something you might want to know about New Bridges. You can um, inquire at either of those email addresses. So um, let me ask: Were there any surprises in your did anything? And uh, without divulging what someone else said, was there any surprises that came up for you? in your three-way? I would just say, it's okay. I was surprised how much love there was in our little room. We don't even know each other. It was just a fountain of connection and um, intimacy. You mean who we really are got to be there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Any other surprises? Mm. Miguel, do you want to say another word or two about that? About what um, what I wrote? Uh-huh. Anti-blackness stops us from fully experiencing the world. Um, we talked about it in our group about the fact that when, when there's anti-blackness, we miss out. 
we miss out in fully experiencing the joy and the love and the brilliance and the color and the life of this world. And we miss out. And then it becomes a snowball effect. There's anti-black, there's anti-immigrant that whenever there's anti something, we miss out. And so, um, you know, we were talking about how we should be celebrating blackness just like we should celebrate, we should be celebrating women, you know, celebrating different faiths and say, God, isn't it beautiful? Isn't it beautiful that we could enjoy and we could lift up? But when we have anti-blackness, our lives are, 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 are stolen. We miss out. So, um, yeah, we're, we're here this one time and we got to enjoy it. We got to be, we got to be kin, right? And see each other as kin. Um, so that, that's, I'll, I'll shut up because I get, you know, this is, this is important stuff. So I'll shut up and let other people speak. <laughs> what we do in the Center for Social Justice every day. Yeah. Let me, let me say um, to this part of us that knows there's only one and we want that oneness, we want that unity. Um, I am definitely on that end of the spectrum and have been, I don't know, I, I don't know. I think it's my temperament, who knows it's karma, I don't know. But what I've learned this time around is that we have to deal with this question what comes up that gets in the way of being one with each other? Because we can have that ideal, but something stops us from being able to reach it. And the New Bridges work is about that. What gets in the way of me feeling completely connected to you and you to me, of me being 100% clear that I want for you what I want for myself, that I don't want you to be denied or deprived of anything that I have access to, what gets in the way of me living that out? And I think I just, just I, let me just, does anything come to mind? What gets in the way of us living that ideal? Fear, insecurities, Christina, you had your hand raised. Uh, wounding. Wounding. The wounds. Mm. The wounds that are not acknowledged and that haven't had a chance to really heal because they're not acknowledged on both sides. The unconscious wounds that we carry as whites, that we just, a lot of it, we inherit it from generations before of us and then we continued. And I think those are part of how we keep um, not being able to bridge unless we, we are helped to, together to look at this and acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. yes. I think when you said fear, there's a number of fears that stand in our way of making these connections um, one is just fear of the unknown, that separateness that you talked about before. You know, this is strange. I don't know this. I'm afraid I won't engage. The general fear of strangers, of connecting, a fear of what um, a doctor, Dr. Ellison, that we're working with white allies right now, uh, talks about plopping. That is, you put out an idea in a group and it just plops and it, no one responds to it. You know, you know, oh no, why did I say that? Mm -hmm. um, the fear of, particularly for white people, of feeling ignorant. Though, you know, we know we don't know what we're talking about really, not from firsthand experience. So we don't, we, and we, haven't, we haven't studied it all of our lives. So there's that fear. And finally, 
there's a fear of walking into systems that may seem so big and so oppressive that we couldn't make a dent no matter what we did. Medical systems, city hall, you know, you name it, big systems. And we're afraid to speak up in those systems that seem so enormous and impenetrable. So it's all fears, but there are a lot of fears that hold us back. Yeah, yeah. Um, Christina, you said it really like something that like spoke to me. It was um, like, it starts at a young age. And I feel like that is just, it starts with the youth, like going to schools, making sure schools are teaching about Black History Month talks about like how someone's like picture um their like icon picture here is black history is american history and um it just it starts like there like making sure that kids are raised knowing that like there shouldn't be a division there shouldn't be a divide between um that everyone should be at the same ground there shouldn't be other levels whether it's color, whether it's um, like education, whether it's class, we're all people. And it should, that's something that starts with the youth and classes and schools and what they teach students. Thank you. Uh, is your name Berta or is that somebody else's name? It's someone else's name. My name's Alana. Thank you, Alana. <laughs> So I feel that some, one of the things that gets in our way is trust. Um, I, I sit in, I, I get my nails done. I sit in a, in a sweet little nail salon where the ladies are speaking Vietnamese to each other and there's people uncomfortable because they don't trust that these ladies aren't talking about them. Mm. Uh, and that trust goes across all cultural differences where uh, leaning over and talking to somebody and laughing and they're sure at, and you don't trust what they're saying that that's something that they're saying hasn't got something to do with you i don't know if that's a white cultural attribute but it's certainly an attribute that i've seen time and time again is this lack of instant instinctive trust we have with others that you know that's so interesting eleanor you bring that because it's it's i think the trust factor um, it is a huge deal. And so how do we then, in those here, how do we take that and learn to trust? And, um, you know, it's, you know, when I'm in situations and other people are speaking other languages, I'm like, man, I wish I learned that language, you know, cause I wanna, I'd wanna talk too. And so it challenges me not just to learn the language for that sake, but to to, to understand that the, the uniqueness of another culture and, and their history and, and just all that juicy stuff that enriches life, right? Um, but trust is key. So Again, I'm going to encourage you to check out New Bridges because we have very little time left. Um, but I want to, um, I've been, I started doing unlearning oppression work in 1984 or five when I started the training, 84, with Yeshi's sister, um, Ricky. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a grueling training. We went from Friday night to Sunday evening um, going through processes that um, were designed to, uh, to help us unlearn oppression. And so one of the images we have in New Bridges is this pill that, that, op that oppression uh, sits on top of, a, of two pillars, right? It's almost like a, ta like a tabletop, right? You could imagine this says oppression right here. And then each pillar, there's these pillars that uphold it. One of which is the institutional, systematic, day-to-day -day routine, it's everywhere you can see, you know, in all of our organizations, as someone pointed out, who was that? I forget already. Uh, anyway, 
it's everywhere, right? And it's in these institutions. And so that's one pillar. The other pillar is the pillar of the, of the effects, how we have internalized that system. We haven't only internalized anti-blackness or anti-womanness or anti-queerness or anti-low class, lower classness. We've internalized the ways that that gets driven in. This is the piece. We internalize that which holds it in place, not just the content of the oppression. Is this making sense? So I didn't just internalize that something was wrong with blackness or that um, I needed to be fearful of white people. I internalize the fear of the system itself and how it holds that in place. I internalize, so I know exactly how to do it to somebody else. This is what I'm talking about. I know how to do it to you because I internalized how you do it to somebody. Not just the, not just the oh, black people are this, not just the stereotypes. Maybe that's how I wanna say it. I didn't just internalize the stereotypes, I internalized that which keeps the stereotypes in place and justifies the actions that come from them. So if I'm with a person with disability who's upset because they don't have access, who's upset because the culture would rather them stay out of the way and not be an inconvenience and not be an eyesore and that person starts complaining about ableism, I, I react. I want them to be nice in how they show that they're upset. I don't want them in my face about it. I want them to package it in a way that doesn't make me feel uncomfortable. I want to control how they get free. Okay, I'm not against you getting free, but you know what, you have to back up a little bit because I don't like how you're coming at me. So I don't have room in myself for the natural anger that target, we call them target group people, that people who are in target groups are gonna have. We get mad at the angry woman angry black person. So I too have internalized that. You don't get to be mad about your oppression. You better be, you better do, if you're gonna get free, you better do it right according to my agenda. Problem with this is there's no call and response. This is one of the things about I love about black culture. You get so much call and response, but it's hard on Zoom. Can you indicate somehow how this is landing, if it's making sense to you, the difference between stereotype and the system. And um, this is, um, I was just thinking of uh, Tim, um, what you're Actually, talking about reminded me of a quote I read from Ava DuVernay this week. Um, it was in the Time Magazine. Uh, article on the black renaissance, but I think she was talking about anti-blackness and, and she was saying, um, this is generations of oppressive calculated misinformation that you're dealing with. And so, you know, everyone in this room is, you know, it's a good fight. We're all swimming against the tide, <laughs> trying to swim up river against the tide, you know, up, against you know, gener it's, it's, this is generations of misinformation that you're working against. So it's just something to remember. It, it's it's difficult. I've been working at this for trying to for a few years, and I, I'm still, <laughs> you know, I, I, since you're talking, I feel like I'm just starting <laughs> after after all those years. But yeah, that's that's and what I'm like. I love you for it. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. I'm glad you're with us. Thank you. I wanna move here a little bit because I did make some promises and I haven't fulfilled them, any of them yet, but, uh, or I shouldn't say that, I haven't fulfilled the ones I want to. I wanna uh, draw on four um, invitations that uh, 
um, Brian Stevenson makes. How many people know who Brian Stevenson is? Quite a number. He, um, he wrote a book called Just Mercy. He had, there's a TED talk that you can hear, you know, you can pretty much hear his whole philosophy on there. He also uh, started an organization called EJI in Montgomery, Alabama, um, which is one of the, how would you say, Miguel? Montgomery was like a, a hub, a, a marketplace. Like if you go, it's like, I don't know. It was a place where many, many, many enslaved people came through there. Um, a warehouse. It was an actual warehouse where slaves were taken off the ships and, and put in into this building to be stored until the auction block down the street would, would happen. Yeah, so, you know, and it's by the river, so river places are all, you know, are those places. Um, and so every, I think I mentioned we go to on this, these, um, this, pil this pilgrimage to Alabama. And, um, but Brian Stevenson is a lawyer. He has worked tirelessly for many, many years to get people off death, death row to get people who were unfairly charged and, um, and uh, prosecuted, um, reduce sentences, get them out, et cetera, et cetera. And um, he, in his book, he lists four things that all of us can do. So this is going to the whole thing about the, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? Um, and they're not like go to the, you know, go down. It, it's not that specific, but it's pretty specific. And one of the, one of the uh, invitations is to get proximate, get close, get close to the people and the places and the things that, um, you know, in this case, get close to blackness. Um, this can be tricky because um, I'm always hesitant to do these kinds of uh, re recipes because everything is about the mindset that you take in. If you take a mindset of um, ownership, of colonializing, of uh, thinking that you're, you know, you're the it's a missionary thing, um, it can it can have the opposite effect of what we want. We want connection. We want relatedness. We want uh, everybody to feel free. So, but that said, getting close really can be a wonderful thing. And I go again to Glide. People came from all over, you know, very wealthy counties right there on the street. And that getting close um, erases some of the, uh, the mythology that holds our separation in place. So getting close. And the value, the Glide value that aligns with that is for the people. One of Glide's values is for the people. And I already told you how um, Cecil lived that. Uh, I'm, just for a second, there's a, a, a safety uh, team member at Glide. The safety team are people who make sure that everybody feels safe. You know, There's a lot that goes on in the Tenderloin and um, people get are, are distressed a lot of times and they come to the building in a state of distress. So they need a hosting, they need um, a convivial environment. They need someone holding the environment. So Glide safety team, many of them come from prison, from all kinds of walks of life. They've had issues with drugs and blah, blah, blah. One of the safety team members told me that um, he was in the, in the meals line and Cecil saw him and said, you wanna come work for me, be my driver. And this person said, yes. And, uh, and so he said one day he, he, he went to pick them up and um, they got in the car and Cecil realized he had forgotten something. So he asked this person, go into the house here, take my keys, go in the house and get this thing for me. And he said, I got to the door and I opened the door and I stood inside the hallway and just wept because here was this pastor giving me the keys to his house. 
and I had this past that, you know, I didn't feel like I deserved that. But it, it, he, he said, that's why if you want to get after, if you want to come after Cecil, you got to come out through me. Right. So people have that kind of loyalty to him, but that's getting proximate. Um, develop new narratives. This, I feel like this is one of the strongest ones. I have the strongest feeling for this one. New narratives. We know the old narratives. We know them. We know degradation has happened. We know that there's a need for reparation. We know all these things, but what new narratives are gonna help us move in that direction? What new narratives do we need? For me, it's seeing ourselves as beings of light and power. Because if I'm just this fat girl from the, you know, from the from Western edition who used to be on welfare and, you know, blah, blah, blah. I just, it, that story, that narrative limits what I can do in this world, but I am not limited by those. Another hint or tip, um, India Ari has a song called I Am Light. Check it out if you don't already know it. It's all over YouTube, it's all over the place. But so my new narrative is I just look black and fat and female. I am a divine being who came here to anchor light on this planet. That's what I am. And the more I feel into it, the more I trust it, the more I act on that, the more creative I become, the more flexible I become, the more empowered I become. And that is available to each and every one of us. Your portal might be different from mine. There are many, 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 many portals. For some it's nature, for some it's animals, for some it's uh, Buddhism, for some it's Taoism, for some it's Judaism. It does not matter. What helps you contact that part of yourself that can rise above this bullshit? Because that's what it is. And it'll keep pulling you down, keep pulling you down, keep pulling you down. I'm trying to find that which lifts me up above it. So I'll keep off, off track again, but it's on track for me. <laughs> Do uncomfortable things. I think that when, as I let this, this part of me that is bigger than my ego, that is bigger than my history, uh, when I let that part lead, I'm much less afraid to get, um, to do uncomfortable things. Um, and the way that that gets, oh, I'm sorry, going back to develop uh, narratives, the narrative at Glide that was different and new and I think still is, is that we're all in recovery. And it doesn't mean recovery from drugs and alcohol. And it does mean that, but it doesn't only mean that. It's recovery from a loss of humanity, a loss of soul, a loss of purpose, a loss of connection. Um, and then doing uncomfortable things, the value at Glide that most speaks to this is truth telling. So right away, I get you into these triads, you don't know each other. And I'm asking you to say, how has this affected you? That's truth telling. If you did it, you were using this value. Glide holds that value very high. You don't have to hide anything. You don't have to hide anything. There's nothing that you've done or anything that exiles you from the human family unless we just decide that that's how it is, which is, a lot of people are deciding that these days. I'm gonna cancel you. I'm gonna cancel you. You're canceled, you're canceled. Um, I'm glad to work somewhere where that's not part of the culture. We don't, it's not part, of, it's not cancel culture at Glide. And then um, the last one that Brian Stevenson says is stay tethered to hope. And the key way that I see that being uh, lived at Glide is through celebration. And I, um, I just want to add to that, that um, when I was studying for the, my dissertation, 
I came upon this, um, this practice that uh, enslaved people had of working, you know, 14, under, 14 hours under blazing sun. And then instead of going and collapsing in their slave cabins, huts, whatever, or eating, they tried to find hush harbors, they were called hush harbors, where they could go and praise and make noise, testify to each other, listen to each other, dance, pray, cry, shout, because it's a very expressive religion. The religiosity of the culture, I'm not talking about individuals because there are black individuals who are not that way, but the culture promotes a very expressive embodied religiosity. So that to me gave them hope when they went into those hush harbors and sang and wept and swayed and held each other and told each other their stories that that renewed, that had a renewing effect. And it has benefited the broader culture because it got fine tuned into a very, very beautiful way of taking people to the spiritual realm. And so black folks do that all the time. And if there's nothing else that you can do, but say, you know, we owe something to black people for spirituality. There's a spirituality, even if it's through jazz, through blues, through rock and roll, through funk music, that spirituality is Im embedded and encoded in that, in that, in that, those genres. It's not just the church music. It's all the music, all the music. You, you use it as a way to enter a certain space and to express your soul. And we've offered that to the world. So that's something that even just saying, you know what? I love this about black people. Black, you know, I love this. I mean, people have said it. I love how they sing. There's a way that it's been used that it was kind of off-putting for many of us, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how have how has virtuality helped us all to hang on to something, to acknowledge that. That is a beautiful thing to do. Um, so one more concrete thing that I would like to suggest is that you create a statement of emancipation for yourself. And mine would sound something like this. I will not allow my conscience, my consciousness to be used to further anti-blackness. Not one more day. I will not allow my consciousness to be used that way. Make mantras, make mantras in your mind. Um, another one that I offer, you can say it quietly. You can say it before you go to bed. You can say it when you wake up. You can say it when you're walking through the street or when you see a black person. It's all internal. You're not saying it out loud. May my heart and my mind and my consciousness be a sanctuary for all black people. That's one of mine. The other uh, um, thing you can do is find partners. Find other people who care about this and you feel some affinity with them and make groups, small groups, a, a group of three and, and, and just practice loving accountability, practice having, telling your stories to each other. Oh, today I, I noticed that I wanted to cross the street when I saw da, 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 or whatever um, or Whatever it is, like be in a group because when you're in a group that light grows, it increases and intelligence, more intelligence can come in into a group than, than when I'm alone. I 
I tried not to flood you. Um, I hope this, I hope there was something helpful here for you. I would love it if you uh, could type into the chat anything that uh, was helpful that you want more of. Um, let's stay connected. Thank and you. Is there anybody who, yeah. like Miguel, do you feel like singing us a song to close out? I want to impress, not depress. So. <laughs> So I may not be the right person to be singing the song. And people, <laughs> it's Friday. Is there night. somebody on here who is willing to sing us a goodbye song? Okay, then you're gonna hear me again. <laughs> I'm looking at Bill and saying, "Poor Bill. Bill's come is in one of my other groups. It's like, oh Lord, here she goes again." But I tried, Bill. I tried. All right, here we go. And I'm singing this to myself. How could anyone ever tell you that you're anything less than beautiful? How could anyone ever tell you you are less than whole? How could anyone fail to notice that your loving is a miracle. How deeply you're connected to my soul. So oh, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you're you all. Welcome. Thank you. Sing that to yourself. We hope to Thank see you. Thank you. Again. I send you love and light. We hope to see you again. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Bye, Shelby. Bye, it's okay. Yeah, bye -bye. Thank you. That was awesome. That was beautiful. Thank you, Bissa. Thank you, Yeshi. Sarah, thank you. Thank you, Isoke. See you soon. Okie dokie. Love you.